Today we'll be talking about adoption. Adoption. Uh, it's a doctrine from soteriology, which you all know by now it's referring to the doctrine of salvation. How does adoption work? Why is that doctrine important to us? Is it significant to know that we've been adopted by God? Absolutely, because he could have just said that we are his children. Regeneration, we study that, right? Regeneration means that we are born from his family. Why then does he have to put adopt us? I mean, regeneration is good enough. So why put adoption? Because the Lord, when he saved our souls, you don't realize how many benefits he added from that. Our salvation is so easy. There was such a high cost. He died on the cross, right? God himself gave up his life. That's bigger than a trillion dollars than all the world combined. When God did that for your salvation, you and I fail to realize the heavy blessings and benefits we received. And one of them is adoption. When regeneration could have been just good enough that we are born from his family. But there's a more particular specific reason why just being born from his family is not enough when God saved our souls. He believes that I have to adopt you. And that's what we're going to be studying and finding out from the word of God. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, and then uh, we'll look at verse 5, Ephesians 1 verse 5. The Bible says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Meaning right here that adoption, for some people who didn't know, it comes from an original meaning, the placing of a son. So not just born from God, but the placing of a son. So I will write that part down, and then we'll go step by step. And then uh, make sure that the angle is in the right spot. Okay, then I will stay right there. And then I will write down the meaning of adoption. Oop, that's the eraser version, okay. The Greek word also, when our New Testament was originally written in Greek, it also matches with the meaning, the placing of a son. Not just born, but God put you in a certain position. That position is what secures, believe it or not, your salvation. Meaning you cannot lose it then once he placed something on you. The other passage that I want you to turn to, which we have, is in Galatians. And then chapter 4, if your hand is there, Galatians chapter 4. The first section which we are covering is meaning of adoption. The meaning of adoption. Throughout the Bible, the... Use of adoption had twofold meaning. So the placing of a son operated in this way. It's one, the private act of receiving a stranger into the family as a son. The second operation for its meaning is the public legal ceremonial act of recognizing the son as the heir. It's like something like a coming out or coming of age party. So we understand why God didn't just regenerate us, but from this meaning, adoption has something very important. As I mentioned before, as we look at these two operations, one is the stranger. And if we recall who we were before we got saved, what we were before we got saved, we might recall that God saw us as his enemies, strangers. He, do, he didn't recognize us as his children. So adoption was so important because he had to recognize the strangers as I placed you as my children. 
Hence, regeneration is not enough when he saved us because of our position as strangers back then. Remember, regeneration had to do where your spirit was dead. It's not your position as a stranger. You're a dead person. You weren't even a child to begin with. Basically, you are non-existent. See that? Non-existent as his child. But God remembered your existence before you got saved was a stranger. That position has to change. That's why adoption is necessary, so that he can see you as his child, not a stranger. When he regenerates you, it's got to be more than just being a child. He's got to transform your stranger state. The second thing is the son is recognized within a public, legal, ceremonial act in the courtroom. Remember that concerning justification when you and I got saved? When you and I got saved, the Lord, he had to do a judicial act. The judicial act is what made you innocent. Well, doesn't God have to judge you for your sin? That's part of being an honest judge. If he lets you into heaven like that, he's not an honest judge. To become an honest judge and to let you in heaven, in spite of the stranger that you were, your sin problem, not only did he justify you, make you holy, but a bonus is, hey, I'll make you my child. So the judicial act is not done. Hence, adoption was necessary to continue the judicial act of not just justifying you, making you holy, but also, as a bonus, you're my child. That's why this is very important. It's a judicial act, a ceremonial act, legal act. No matter what arguments that the devil can bring around God's law, to use God's law against you, God already fulfilled the law through the power of adoption. See, he didn't break the law. He fulfilled it. It's a genius thing what he did at salvation. Judicial and also the position, placement. So from stranger to son. We continue on in the meaning of adoption with Galatians 4, verse 1. You'll notice, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Compare that with 1 Kings 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. A lot of you didn't know this, but in the Old Testament, the Lord, oh, excuse me, the Father, well, he could also be a Lord as well. When the child was born, he didn't just put him into a powerful position like that. He treated the child like a servant. Now, of course, he's his child, but at the same time, he couldn't, uh, he had to treat him as a servanthood position. Within a servanthood position, the child could not have as much rights as an heir, much uh, power as an heir. He had to be in the position of servants. So servants don't have to necessarily listen to a three-year-old child demand all the time. Why? Because the child did not yet receive the position as heir. Too young. He's considered as a servant. So that's how it worked in the Old Testament for a lot of people who didn't know that. You'll notice in 1 Kings one twenty-three. And they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was coming before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? And then verse 26, But me, even me, thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and thy what? Servant Solomon hath he not called. You'll notice right here that even though they were David's children, they were still considered in a servanthood position. They didn't have a rulership position. If they had any rulership, it was still a submissive role, nevertheless, underneath the king. It was still restrained, submitted. That's why Galatians 4 verse 1, it argues here that the heir 
as a child differeth nothing from a servant back then. Now do you see why adoption is important? Because it gave that judicial, a ceremonial act. Due to being a ceremonial act, it's basically your coronation, a, recogn a recognition from God up in heaven telling everybody with this special day, this special ceremony, better than any graduation you had in high school Amen. or in college or even a wedding ceremony. This ceremony was very special. It's God making sure that everybody recognizes this is my heir to all of heaven and hell. That's what he did. Baptism, do you realize that's a ceremony? It's showing off to all the world who you are. I'm an adopted child of God. It's very important. It's very special, this adoption. Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. If you don't think it's that important, then God could have just put you as the same position with the angels in being servants, serving him, right? He could just save you from hell and make you holy like the angels, that's it. But God put you in a position higher than the angels. He made you his son, that's an heir. That's why this doctrine is very important. Even if he were to justify you, do you realize even if he were to justify you that the doctrine of justification will still perhaps make you in a similar role as the angels, not above them? That's why this doctrine is important to you. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. Notice that when Moses became of age, he was given the position of the adopted son of Pharaoh. By faith... Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See that? That's how it worked in the Old Testament. And then uh, when we go back to Galatians chapter 4, let's look at other verses that described your adopted position as God's son, his heir. These are really good verses. If we go to Galatians 4, we read verse 1. Now we continue on with verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. If you read in verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. That's something. Amen. Do you realize the weight behind those words? Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, yeah, but a son. If it weren't for adoption, get rid of adoption, even if God were to justify you, save you from hell, die on the cross for you, give you forgiveness of sins, the doctrine of forgiveness and the doctrine of justification will still make you a servant. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Don't you think heaven's enough? But he gives you an opportunity to reign. To reign. That's really special. Okay. We're going to look at uh, Ephesians 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. And then we'll look at verse 4. Ephesians 1 and verse 4. Now the time of adoption. When did he adopt you? When did he adopt you? The verse goes in three stages, believe it or not. So the timing of adoption works in past, present, and future. Now there are some Bible believers who would think that it's only referring to salvation, but I think, and this is just opinion, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but because I'm responsible for teaching you, it's best that I give you my opinion, right, from the scripture. There's three stages. A lot of Bible believers ignore that part. There's a past stage, and there's a present stage, and then there's a future stage. The past stage is in reference to before the foundation of the world. It's referring to the beginning of time. 
that God actually adopted you to be his child. That's very powerful. Long before you were born, long before creation, God chose you to be his adopted Ooh. child. He wanted heirs. He wanted son. Do you realize how fortunate you are? If he never had that long before the beginning, then he wouldn't have created you. See that? He wouldn't have died on the cross for you. He wouldn't have elevated you in a position above the angels. The only reason why he did that is because long before at the beginning, he always had that in mind, that intention. He wanted a group of children to be his heir. That's strong. Verse 4, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So it's been predestinated. It's been your destiny long before the foundation of the world. Now, obviously, what comes to mind is Calvinism then. So it seems like the Calvinists are making sense. However, Calvinism is wrong. We strongly disagree that before the foundation of the world, God chose a specific special elite or elect. Elites are not different, much different from elect, right? So it's same satanic globalist conspiracy in your pastor's opinion. But anyway, uh, we don't believe in that. That's such a wicked position, thinking that God chose the majority of people to burn and scream, torment forever in hell with a small group of special elites going to heaven? Nah, it doesn't jive with me. But then you're probably wondering, Pastor, you said long before the beginning of time, God chose me to be his adopted child. So isn't that Calvinist? No. It points out right here, the ones that he chose in verse 4, according as he had chosen us, me, why? Based on a condition. See that? Calvinism is unconditional election. That's what they call it, their doctrine. No, it's a conditional election. In other words, if you receive Christ as your salvation, if you are in him, then those are the people he chose before the foundation of the world to be in heaven with him, to be his adopted children. So the reason why you have been chosen before the foundation of the world is because you decided to be in him. That's what you have to understand. Long before the creation of time, basically, it's this simple. God says, you know what? I want my own sons to be with me in heaven. But obviously, I can't just allow anyone into heaven. So those who are in my son, Jesus Christ, I'm going to have them with me in heaven for all eternity. It's that simple. That's who he chose before the foundation of the world. All right, we're going to look at uh, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. So that's your past. The present is your salvation, your current standing. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ then presently God adopted you and you're considered an adopted child of God. So that's pretty obvious from the beginning of the lesson. We knew adoption had to refer to salvation. Galatians 3, 26, the Bible says, For ye present tense are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. See, it's based off of Ephesians 1, in Christ Jesus again, by faith. Uh, notice right here, 1 John 3, 1 John 3, verse 2, verse 2, it is a present possession that is not lost. Adoption secures your salvation. Yes, we believe one saved, always saved, not because it's heresy, but because one, the Bible says so, and two, it is Christian basic doctrine, a basic of all basics. If they say that what I teach is heresy, once saved, always saved, they don't even know basic doctrine 101. They deny adoption. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now, see, now, present tense, now are, present tense, we the sons of God. It's a present possession. 
Now it's a future possession. Look at Romans 8, Romans chapter 8. If you read the next part of that verse 2 we looked at earlier, you'll notice a rapture, right? So because you are an adopted child, it now leads you to the future adoption. The future adoption is Romans 8, 23. The rapture, the rapture. Do you know why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Oh, I don't believe in a rapture. Some clown tried to uh, give me, what, a hundred something verses, you know, that there is no rapture or no pre-tribulation rapture, either or. And uh, guess what? I'm not interested in that. If you want to meet me or come to my church because you want to show me how, what I'm wrong in my teaching, not interested. We're going to say, go back home, buddy. All right? So one pastor did that for me. I didn't really have to do that to the person. But I'm not interested in that. Why? Because this is Basic Doctrine 101. And that shows me you don't even know Basic Doctrine 101. And you're going to try to tell me and teach me what I'm wrong about when you don't know easy Basic Doctrine. Go on home and read your Bible again. Watch this video and you be teachable. All right, right here, the rapture. Why is this basic doctrine 101? That there has to be a rapture or pre-trib rapture? Because it's part of adoption. It's so secure, not just your salvation, but your salvation from this earth. We're going to get out of this earth. We're going to be up in heaven with him. Our body, our literal body will go up there. I'm not talking about soul, your literal body. That's a rapture. That's why we call it rapture, Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. See, if you have the Spirit, then notice, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the what? Adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. See, you're, you're going to be delivered. Your body is going to change, be raptured up there with Him. Now we're going to come to the blessings of adoption. Now, this is going to be really great stuff. The blessings of adoption. And there's a lot of stuff here. Go to John 17. Be prepared to go through a lot of verses. Go to John chapter 17. And then we'll look at verse 21. John chapter 17. And then uh, we'll look at verse uh, 21. There are literally nine blessings within adoption and there's going to be likely more if you're an adopted child of god the blessings that you receive placing of a son an heir right so he has to have some rewards blessings possessions that he owns so let's see what an heir gets the heirs would uh, receive as follows one, he, he becomes part of the beloved. He is loved by God. Amen. Why is that important? Because then you'd be burning in hell right now if God didn't love you. How can God be a God of love and let people burn in hell forever? Because he don't love you. That's the easy answer. If you hate something so much, then you can let a thing burn in hell for all eternity. If you have no empathy, no compassion whatsoever, you can let a person burn in hell forever. See, a lot of people didn't get that. So they accuse God. Uh, how can God be a God of love? Well, it's because we don't believe in that wrong doctrine that churches teach, that God loves everybody. God only loves those who receive his son. The only time he ever displayed his love to all the world was when he died on the cross. Right. Why? Because the cross is the only means for you to receive the love. If the person rejects the cross, he rejects God's love. And he's in God's wrath. So in John chapter 17, verse 21, we become part of the beloved. Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and as thou hast loved me. That's very strong there. How much God loves you is as much as he would love Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. Do you know why? Because Jesus is his son and you are his son. That's why his love is that strong on you. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 12. 
Luke chapter 12. The second blessing is they are taken care by the Father. The Father cares for them. Because you're his son, he has to take care of you. That's a wonderful thing. Isn't it amazing that within every parent, or it should be, it should be within parents that they have a care for their children, want to look after them. So because that's part of nature, how can God separate that from you? So he has to care for you. Luke 12, verse 27, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. See that? Your father. God mentioned that about you, recognizing you're his son, his adopted son. And that's why he says, because everybody around the world, they see these as needs, isn't it natural for God to recognize your needs? He knows your needs, so he'll take care of you. First uh, John chapter 3, First John chapter 3. Yeah, I like this one. I, I like this one. You got the family name. You know that? You got the family name. That's really awesome. See, my last name is not Kim. My last name, excuse me for saying this, and I hope you won't consider this as blasphemy, Jesus Christ. You might say, are you saying you're Jesus Christ? That's blasphemy. No, I'm not saying I'm Jesus Christ. I'm saying that I'm Jesus Christ's child. I am God's child. Because of that, I took and I have his last name. Amen. I have his last name. I have his name within my last name. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that what? We should be called. See that? A title. The sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. See that? God is placed within that calling, Amen. that title. That's why I have him as my last name. Now, if, uh, if you want to say sons of God rather than God, that's fine, okay? If you're kind of nervous about what I mentioned before. But the point is, is that I'm connected to his name. It doesn't change that fact. Amen. As a son, I'm connected to his name. If we're to uh, look at the next passage, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, I have his likeness. I have his likeness, Romans chapter 8. Whenever you look at your child, some people might say, oh, he looks like you. He takes after you. Well, praise the Lord, I have his likeness as well. Amen. A lot of times I don't live it, but when God looks deep inside my heart, he sees a resemblance of him in there. Amen. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's in there. That's something. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be what? Conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So whether it be the rapture or during salvation, the point is, is that we have his image. We have his image. So we have the family likeness. Uh, look at 1 John 3, verse 14. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. Not only do I have the love as much as God would love his only begotten son, but I have the family love. I am conjoined with a wonderful family and I receive the family love. Think about it. It's one thing for God to love you, but it's another thing to know that God's not the only one that loves you. A lot of people think that way, that when they keep looking at dirt in church, they think that nobody loves them. But you have to realize there's a lot of people who love you because you're part of the family. And even if you had zero love on earth, which I highly doubt, you have a family up in heaven who love you because you're part of the household. Even brothers and sisters, they, are, they find imperfections with each other. They don't get along with each other. But somehow, in some way, there's that attachment in the heart, that love still. Why? Because you're part of the family bloodline. That cannot be separated. Uh, 1 John 3, 14. God takes this seriously. 
We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now, ain't that something? That verse points out when you and I got saved. See, passed from death unto life. So that's connected to our salvation. So when we got saved, we're supposed to have the family love. Ain't that something? So that's a part of salvation. Uh, Romans 8, Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, and then we'll look at verse 15. Romans chapter 8, and then we'll look at verse 15. Not only are you loved by the Father, but also you receive the close relationship with Him. You ever seen parents where I mentioned to you before, in the old days, they would consider the children as servants, not as heirs. And you can even become an heir, but we've seen those parents who are distant from their children, right? Busy with work or their own things, selfish things in life, and they don't spend time with their children. Now, God has every right to do that with you and I, but he wants a close relationship with you. Do you understand that? Amen. God is so busy with so many things nowadays, but he wants to spend time with you, and literally every second. That's something. Parents don't do that nowadays. Parents prefer to be lost in their work than in their children. Parents refer to take a break from their children, do their own thing. Parents refer, uh, ref, uh, prefer, excuse me, not refer, prefer to have their own fleshly weaknesses, their own selfish interests in life, not their children. Especially when children misbehave. Who wants to spend all their time and energy on their children? God would, even when you misbehave. You just plead the blood and then get back in your relationship with him. Ain't that something? Uh, where did I put my notes? Okay, sorry. All right, Romans chapter 8. What a wonderful father we have. Verse 15, 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. All right, since we're in an adopted state, God wants whereby, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that shows the closeness of relationship. He wants that. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Now, if you got a blessing from our Hebrew study, then you're going to say amen to this one. We receive fatherly chastisement. We receive fatherly chastisement. Amen. I don't know if you remember, but if you recall in our last lesson, the reason why God will keep chastising you, even when you're living right... The only reason why God wants to chastise you is to be there as a father where you're the one who cannot walk, who cannot lift up the feeble hands and the feeble needs. So like a therapist, even though it hurts, chastisement is not punishment. Chastisement is healing right. for those who are good. For those who live bad, it is, in a sense, punishment even though that's not the right biblical word, but he only does that to heal you. So whether you're bad or good, the point is, is that he's trying to heal you. That's what chastisement is. When people say, I don't want that, then what they want is to be an abandoned child. See that? So they want God to get off their back. Then you want God to abandon you, but he can't do that. Why? You're adopted, not abandoned. Amen. If you forgot about that lesson, then I would encourage you to go back and watch that video. That is probably the top 20 videos I ever taught, is that verse-by-verse -verse Hebrew study on suffering and chastisement in Hebrews 11 and 12. Now go to Hebrews 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children. We sure did. We sure did. My son. See, God's trying to tell you why he's doing it. He's reminding you because you're my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Whereof if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. See, you want to be abandoned. 
You know what the point of Ill illegitimate children are? Is that they've been abandoned. They've been abandoned. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, it's for our betterment, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no ch chastening up for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Another benefit is you receive fatherly comfort. Comfort. We see that we share his likeness. We have a very close relationship and that he would chastise us. But also his job is to comfort you. Thank God. If it was all about chastisement, then we'd be dead, right? We'd be very bitter at him. His job as a therapist, even though you have to exercise those feeble legs where it hurts you so much, that process of chastisement is intended to heal you. Amen. But that therapist is so patient that at times he'll give you a break, he'll comfort you. At times when he even does chastisement, he'll try to do it in a way that will comfort you. Amen. Now, that's a great father. He knows what he's doing. Amen. He's doing a great job even though you and I think that he's not. Come on. So in Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. So, because God is our Father, see that? The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That ties in with your adoption. Because He's your Father, His job is to comfort you. Uh, we look at 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. As an heir, all these should be sufficient for what we possess. But that ain't your inheritance. Can you believe that? That ain't your inheritance. So God still has much more for you as an heir to own, to reign, and to possess. He has an inheritance ready for you in the future. So 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, tied in with adoption, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See that? It's tied to your sonship. Sonship. So because you're his son, verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Because you're adopted, he has to give you an inheritance. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Because you're saved, uh, you are reserved for heaven. Amen. No matter how wicked the adopted son is, he still gains the fatherly inheritance. You got all of heaven. See, that's the point of him saving you. The point of him saving you is so that you can join his fatherly inheritance, which is heaven itself. And to be quite honest, if we were to cross all this out, just this fatherly inheritance, which is heaven, is more than enough. But uh, God has given you much more than uh, heaven. He's given you all of this in addition. That's why it is very important. It is very important to... Uh, be thankful for your standing of adoption. Now let's look at the title of adoption. The title of adoption. This is very interesting. Let's look at Acts 17. Acts chapter 17. A lot of people don't know this. I know that you are a son of God, whereas the rest of the world is a child of the devil, but there is a truth that everyone is an offspring of God. Really? 
So there is a partial truth when people say that all of you are the children of God. There is a partial truth to that. They are the offspring of God. However, the reason why we condemn that is because that's a title, children of God, sons of God. They don't deserve that title. Now let me show you how this works, okay? So this is very interesting. Paul is preaching to lost Grecians. They were just as liberal and wicked as the Bay Area. They always loved the Greeks. Why? Because they all share the same spirit. That's why. <laughs> but anyway, look what Paul said to these wicked people. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live. See, he's referring to those liberal Grecians as well. And move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. See, he's referring to the Grecian pagan poets. For we are also his offspring. How about that? We all come from God, he says. For as much then as we are the what? Offspring of God. Everyone is, even lost people. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Why? Simple. Because he, he pointed out at verse 28, it's because God created us. That's what lost people mean, that we're all the children of God, because we were all created from him. We all come from Adam. So they are right about that. But the wrong thing, like I told you before, is that that's why they think they're all going to heaven, that God loves every single one of them. No, they don't have the title, the title, even though that they come from him in creation. That's one. But number two, it's only a fleshly creation. And fleshly creation is fallen and corrupted. So... When we talk about children of God, we're focusing spiritually here, which they don't have. When we look at Galatians 3.26, Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So, notice who have the title. Who has the title of the children of God? Those who receive Jesus Christ for salvation. They have legitimate rights. They have legitimate titles. Remember, this is a judicial thing. It cannot be separated, this judicial act. A lot of people want to ignore the judicial act. Why? Because they don't want to think about their sins being judged. They don't want to think about a holy judge. That's a problem with this wicked world. But we have to think about this judgment, this act of judgment people keep ignoring. In a judicial sense, this adoption is referring to legitimate title, legitimate rights. You have the claim on the title. You have legitimate rights. By the way, there are people in court who may argue that they have the title to the family heirloom, family inheritance, or even the family name. And believe it or not, sometimes the court will deny it no matter how much they insist that they are, even if it's the truth. Why? Because the court system, we have to understand, is a different setting. It's a different circumstance compared to actually uh, being born or connected to the family name itself. Judicial act is so important because it's trying to recognize publicly. It's to pronounce legitimately a judicial act. That is extremely important. There are people who fought for family names, family connections. There are people even right now who claim that they're connected to uh, Elvis Presley or that Elvis Presley is still alive, believe it or not. And uh, if you go to family heirlooms or fights or signing wills, testaments, it's all an ugly mess. It's all an ugly mess. That's why judicial systems are important because a judicial system finalizes it. It makes something standard, legitimate. Hebrews chapter 12. Think about this then. If they are God's offspring, but they don't have his title, then you know what they are? Illegitimate children. God recognized it. That's why he says he has to chastise you. Why? Because he titled you. See that? Legitimate title. He titled you his son. He titled you his son. That's why he has to keep chastising you. He says, otherwise, 
meaning that it's true, not hypothetical. It's true. Otherwise, you're an illegitimate child. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, that's part of adoption, right? So if you don't have adoption, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It, it's a, what is an illegitimate child or a bastard? It's a seed, it's an offspring that doesn't have the title. That the father recognizes, no, you're not my child. That is denied being part of the family. That's as old as ancient times in the Old Testament. That's something, ain't it? That's something very weighty to think about. Okay, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Because we are the adopted sons of God, we spiritually become Israel, the chosen people of God. So we don't believe that we are the physical nation of Israel, and we don't believe in supersessionism or replacement theology. That's heresy. Amen. However, we believe that, remember, this legitimate title is a spiritual process, yes? Because it is a spiritual process then what we've become spiritually, not nationally, not physically, as a replacement, but spiritually, the nation of Israel. We equate ourselves with being a Jew. Because it's all done as a spiritual process. Uh, when we look at Galatians uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, all right, remember Galatians 4? You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus? Okay, and that's tied to adoption. So if you're adopted then, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Ain't that something? So verse 15 says, your physical nationality had nothing to do with it when you're adopted. And verse 16, let that peace be upon you, Israel of God, he calls you. That's something. All right, let's look at uh, Galatians 4, verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6. That's why God says in that close relationship, since you're his son, he considers you a Jew, so he tells you to call him by the Hebrew or Aramaic word, Abba. Because you're a Jew, Galatians 4, verse 6, verse 6. And because ye are sons, see that? You're adopted. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. How about that? Now we're going to look at Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter 12. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Now, the power of adoption. Get this now. The reason why God adopted you, not just regenerated you and you're his son, is because, get this now, a seed can be disowned. A seed can be disowned. Just like we saw earlier, the offspring of God lost people, but they're disowned, considered illegitimate children. But when you're adopted, what happened? A judicial act was in place. A ceremonial act was in place. A recognition you're no longer a stranger but a son. See that? So this is a public recognition. This makes it known to the public, hey, you can't take that back then. Even the court laws, if it's still ongoing, but when you adopt someone, you can never disown the child and you're considered to be an adopted son. So go to uh, Hebrews 12, verse 7. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. See that? So he could have illegitimate children. We've seen that. But in John 1, check this out. John 1. It's a power when he called you his child. 
That's an adoption then, not just born from him like regeneration. It's a judicial, ceremonial, public, legitimate act. I call you my son. And when he does that, that's a powerful thing. That means he can't take that back. John chapter 1 and then verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, see that? To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See that right there? No will on earth can break that bind, uh, that uh, tie that binds them all together. It's all of God. Your will can't even break it. And it's a powerful thing. You become his son. See that? You become the son of God. It's not that you're just born. You become son of God. That's powerful. Now we're going to look at Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. A father can revoke the laws of marriage, but if the law is still the same up to date currently, the father cannot revoke the laws of adoption. Amen. Divorce and remarriage has been very, very flagrant and common nowadays. Adoption, however, is going to be very hard to break. Even God himself can divorce and remarry. No, he yeah, he can divorce and remarry. So just because you're his wife, he could divorce you if he wanted to. But with adoption, he can't do that. That's why you being his wife is not enough. You've got to be his adopted child. Jeremiah 3.8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. See that? God can divorce his children. He did that with Israel. But again, John 1, 12 through 3, which you wrote down, that's a powerful thing. That cannot be broken. It all ties to this judicial system, man. It all ties to this judicial system. Adoption, we have seen, is stronger than birth. It's stronger than marriage. And lastly, here's a really good one. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. <laughs> this is really encouraging right here. Makes you want to dance and shout. Ephesians 1. An adopted son is favorably selected by the father. Think about it. Why did he adopt you? He could have adopted anybody else. Whereas in birth, there's no choice in the matter. That's why we live in a horrible day and age where people do abortions, like drinking water. This case, however, when you're adopting, you went to great strides, save up much money, and you're willing to give up a lot of things, spend time, pull up great effort for that particular person that you want to adopt as your child. That means there's favoritism there. Whereas for children, they may not receive that. That's how powerful adoption is. So we go to Ephesians 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. See that? He's favorably selected. Why? Predestinated. Before your destiny. Before your destiny. Another one. To himself. That shows that he chose you. That favors him according to the good pleasure of his will. See, his free will was involved. It pleased him to choose you. Woo! Glory to God, man. So there's favoritism there. Favoritism. A natural son, however, does not get that. Adoption does. Now do you see why this is very powerful, adoption? It's very, very powerful. Because it points out right here that God had every intention and had every love and desire specifically for you, for you out of everything, out of time, history, creation, and everything, to be his child. That's why he didn't choose Lucifer. He didn't choose the angels. He didn't choose people who should be better than you. He didn't go by good-looking people, people who did more better works than you and I did put together. He chose specifically 
no matter what nationality you are, no matter how wicked you are, anyone who would receive my son for salvation. Amen. That's a wonderful, touching thing. That's good. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, increased our knowledge of the scriptures, and that we know why adoption is important, the verses to prove adoption, and be able to teach that to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.